So I'm using Blender, uh, which version is it? Splash screen, 2.91. This is the, one of the later betas uh, that are, are coming out now because it's got a couple of extra features which might be useful. I figure it's probably better to um, be working with 2.91 because the multi-res um, modifier, which I'll explain later, has been updated in it. And that's super useful for sculpting. So uh, how do I use Blender? Well, I don't, this is set currently to be out of the box. And what I do with my setup is I change it from the default to right click select, space bar to search, select all toggles and tab for pie menu. That's my, my sort of basic setup. So um, I'm an old school blenderer, so I use right click to select rather than left click select, which throws a lot of people. Um, so when you're watching this video, bear that in mind, I might be saying left click or right click and, and it might be different to you because you might have it set up to work uh, in a sort of more 3ds max way or whatever um sam could you ask your students uh, or students if you want to you know put in the chat um do you have any experience in blender uh, or are you all total noobs to, to blender you've never used it before or have you got like let me know your, your, your blender sort of user experience and if you could also just sort of let me know if there's anything in particular, any particular questions you've got about sculpting so I can try and address them. I do have a sort of list of what I'm going to go through, but uh, yeah, that would help. So sculpting. Uh, oh no, actually, before we get to that, I also, I'm using a tablet. Can you see this overlay of, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you, you can see this, but I've just clicked a button to show the overlay uh, of my tablet controls. I don't know if that's displaying. Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah. we can see that. Um, and I've just got a couple of answers to that question. So, uh, a couple One of people saying, get to that. Yep. Um, yeah, so just the only thing I wanted to cover is setting up your, if you are using a stylus, setting up the first button here to middle click and this one to right click is basically it. And then everything else to your preference. But that's, that would be my recommendation if you're using a Cintiq or uh, a Wacom just to set that up. If you're using a Surface, it's slightly different, but you know, that was it. So yeah, if you want to go ahead with that, uh, those answers, Sam. Uh, yes, it's a mix down the middle. Some people have never used it before. Some people have used it a little bit. Um, we won't have any experts, um, but yeah, a, a mix. Okay, right. I was, I mean, I was gonna sort of go more with a masterclass sort of thing where it's like a bit of experience. That's kind of what I've planned for. So. If you guys uh, let us know in the chat if I'm really going too far, okay? Because, sorry, Sam, um, was that? I that wasn't that wasn't me. Sorry, that was someone else. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, uh, whoever it was, I don't know if that was directed at me. I couldn't certainly couldn't hear you. Okay. I guess I'll I'll carry on then. No, um, it doesn't look like these people. Hmm? I think really it's just someone trying to sort their audio out. Bottom left. Well, okay. like he's not just going on the top, bottom left. Click, click. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let those guys do that. I'm just going to push on through. If you, as I said, Sam, just call me up on uh, on you know if people are popping stuff in the chat, and we'll we'll just crack on. So um, yeah, this is uh, Blender by default. Um, what we can do when we're sculpting is we actually have a in these tabs, we have a bunch of different like uh, layouts of the windows, and there's a preset one called sculpting, which is great to use. Nice big screen area, super useful. Um, so I'm going to turn on Dynatopo just for a second because there's there's two mode, two different styles of sculpting in Blender. You've got Dynatopo, which, as you can see, it throws up a warning saying vertex data detected. Dynatopo will not preserve. Vertex colors, UVs, or other custom data. This is really important uh, in the sense of if you're in a production sort of pipeline, then Dynatopo is not recommended because it generates new topology, it generates more mesh, to which I'm going to demonstrate this for you now. So we've got a bunch of different view options here. I'm just going to turn on the wireframe. You can see the wireframe of our cube. And if I start sculpting, it creates more geometry as I sculpt, which is great. I'm just going to set the resolution down a bit more. 
this is really powerful and really great. If you're sort of sketching and you just want to feel it out a bit and just you don't know what you're going to create, you're just going to have a play, then Dinotopo is absolutely fantastic. I'm just going to turn that wireframe off again because we don't need to keep seeing that. Uh, you can also set it to smooth shaded, which is a little more appealing. But you can just sort of sculpt into it and play around. And that's a really good way to sort of learn the ins and outs of sculpting. If you, if you haven't got a direction, you just want to play with some clay. That's great. But if you're not, if you if you have like a production sort of job to do where you've got a base mesh and so on, then you want to be using something called multi-res and we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. And that's really important. Um, I keep jumping ahead on my list of things to say. So the other, a couple of other things which are really important is sculpting takes time. So be comfortable, set yourself up to be comfortable. If you, if the only place you have to sculpt is like your university lab or, uh, or whatever, then, you know, take a blanket in, some comfy clothes, get a drink, you know, take cigarette breaks if that's your thing. Um, but be comfortable and take your time. It's, it, it's going to take time to get used to, and it can be a really enjoyable process. It's probably the most fun thing you can do in 3D is sculpting, uh, at least for me. Um, something else which is really important when you're sculpting something is reference. Um, when you're working on any form of art, you should really have uh, reference imagery. Um, it's... It's great if you're really experienced and you can, you've got a visual library in your head where you can just sort of create without reference, but it, it, it really does sort of, you'll notice the abilities and your, the level of your sculpting, the level of any painting or whatever you're doing. If you're working with reference, it's so much better for you. If you're creating an animal that doesn't exist, like, you know, a dragon, then find pictures of lizards, you know? If you're creating something that does exist, then get pictures of that animal and lots of different kinds of ones that you can sort of merge together. If you're sculpting people, then, you know, um, get people of that sort of nationality and of that sort of um, age and, and, and sort of look at them and, and get lots of different ones that you can, again, you can sort of make a chimera of, you know, you're, you're getting bits from this one, bits from that. You're not copying necessarily from that reference, but you're taking little bits and seeing how they hang together. Uh, in order to aid you in that journey, I use a piece of software called PureRef. PureRef is free. I mean, you can pay, if you've got money in your pocket, then please do donate to the, uh, the guy who makes it or the, the guys who make it. Um, it's this wonderful little overlay that you can sort of just drop images into and it will sit on top of your software and allow you to, 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 to view that reference. There's also a plugin for Blender called QuickRef that I haven't tried, but I imagine it's very similar. So yeah, reference. Um, so I'm gonna get rid of this because I don't need it. I'm going to go on to my faith whale, which is uh, basically for an animated series. I'm doing a concept for at the moment. Um, I want wanted a whale, and I realised while I was playing with it that it's actually a really good surface to experiment with. Um, I, I realise most of you probably aren't making whales for your end of year project or whatever you're working on, um, but it's a really good uh, mesh to sort of get in and experiment and play around with and sort of see what the brushes do. Um, and I would recommend actually every day, if you're trying to get really good at sculpting every day, have a half an hour sculpting on a whale or on a similar, you know, on your mesh of choice. Now, this whale has okay topology. It's already UV unwrapped. So we don't want to use Dynatopo because we'll lose that. What I mean by UV unwrapped is it's been skinned and flattened out so that we can texture and paint and, and bake stuff down onto it. Now, in a typical game workflow, you'll have a low poly asset, and this is considered low poly, and you'll have a high poly sculpt, so a really high res sculpt. And the way we can do that in Blender is by using this modifier called multi-res. And it allows us to keep and preserve our underlying mesh, but to also have a really high res mesh on top. I'm just gonna subdivide it a bunch of times. I'm gonna take that back down. And it allows us to work on these different layers of detail, which is super useful. And then at the end of it, we can bake it all down into a normal map that we apply on the low poly mesh. And that's a really powerful workflow. It's also, it's a bit more organized than Dynatopo. And particularly with Blender's not quite as um, 
it's not quite as 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 good at using the system resources as something like ZBrush. So if you're using high poly meshes, it can eat up memory and your, your you know or all of your computer's resources quite quickly. And and by using multi res, you're controlling that sort of subdivision and only using what you need, which is is also great. So um, yeah, what I'd recommend um, when sculpting is you know. Particularly in a pipeline, uh, actually, I'm going to need to swap to the other thing. Is this character so? Is, is a good example of what I was about to talk about. This character already has a weight painting on it, and it already has a rig associated with it. I haven't included the rig and stuff because some of that's proprietary, and I can't really share that at the moment. But it's got um, it's got its own weight painting, and uh, and just like the whale, it's also got UVs. Although those UVs are <laughs> have been broken at some point, so that's fun. Uh, or are they just mirrored? Who knows? Um, so when you're working on something like this, it's, it's I, I tend to do a lot of the, the structural work for proportions and all that. I will get that done in the modeling rather than in the sculpting. And then I'll just sort of sculpt for detail and sculpt for like playing around artistically. Um, so that's just, yeah, it's just worth knowing. Um, and also, uh, you might notice that this is not the most attractive looking character. He kind of looks like that little kid from uh, Malcolm in the Middle. And <laughs> having good topology is important, but it's also quite, I find quite useful to have a fairly ugly mesh as your base mesh. Because if you've got this really beautiful mesh, it's all, it already kind of looks finished. You might be a little bit afraid of getting into sculpting it and mucking it up. It's a bit like when in art college, you, you think they give you a big, beautiful white piece of paper and you don't want to draw on it because it's gorgeous. And actually your art is going to make it uglier. There's this feeling of this pristine piece of paper and you don't want to muck it up. Well, it can be a bit like that with meshes. So start with something which is already unappealing, but has good topology and then make it pretty. Um, and hopefully you won't fear getting stuck in. And that, that's also worth bearing in mind is when you're, you're sculpting, you've got to make something worse to make it better. That's definitely in my experience anyway. Um, also worth noting, mat caps and various other uh, things. You can change how your object looks. We already had a look at the, the wireframe there. You can change how your mesh displays and that can be crucial in getting a good sculpt because if you do something like adding cavity, um, you know, onto, onto this, they can be so, the, the effect can be so pronounced that it, it makes you think you're making, your sculpt is, is like uh, more aggressive than it is and it can mislead you. So just choose a map cap you're comfortable with and let's get stuck in. So um, what else is on my list? Lights and all that jazz. Yeah, I guess we can worry about that later. Um, I guess I'm, I'm gonna start sculpting. So I've got my multi-res, I'm gonna, just pull this out so that you can actually see the names of the brushes we're working with. And I'm just gonna start having a go. Um, F key, if you hit F and then drag the stylus left and right, it will change the size of your brush on the fly. And if you hit shift and brush, it you can't see it here, but what it actually does is it, it swaps you over to your smoothing brush here. So you can sort of sculpt in and then smooth it back off a bit. I'm just gonna change my sculpting level so that you can probably see that a little bit better. So I could do, um, you can do something a bit like this. Not getting quite enough resolution on this fella. Come on, there we go. So we can do that and then F to make the brush larger, shift, and I can just smooth that back out. So what I quite often find myself doing is sculpting in a little bit and then smoothing it to back it off a touch. So there we go. So I'm just using the standard draw brush, but it's not my favorite brush to work with. I quite like working with, there's a, a number of my favorite brushes here, like clay strips is wonderful for building stuff up. Um, so we can just sort of, it gives us this sort of quite organic thing. Um, and this is using pressure sensitivity, which we can toggle off and off, off and on here for the radius and for the strength. You won't get that if you're working with a mouse, obviously. So it's one of those things that I highly recommend working with a stylus. Um, I have sculpted with a mouse and it is possible, but it is limiting. I use a number of different Cintiqs. Um, I've got 
the this big 24 inch it's about 10 10 years old now um that i'm, I'm using it's like a 1080p big thing i point the camera but i'd never get it back in the same position so <laughs> i'll leave that alone and i've got um, a mobile studio pro 16 inch which is like a, a a laptop which is built around a cintiq um i don't recommend that computer because it is horribly underpowered for the price and they don't last unfortunately but it is great for sculpting on the couch and as i said earlier being comfortable when you're sculpting when you're working on this stuff is really important and it's great that you can stick something on the telly stick it on your lap and just sculpt away and practice and really get sort of back in the flow of things before you do a big sculpt it's always good to have a little practice that's why i was saying something like with this whale he's a great little practice mesh because he's got a number of unexpected curves and little bits of detail but he's not you know Sculpting humans is hard because you've got that uncanny valley thing. You've got this recognizability. We all know what humans are supposed to look like. But whales, you know, <laughs> you can get away with a lot more. You can have a bit more fun with it. You could make it abstract as hell and just, you know, and that's great. So I'm just sort of blocking out some ideas here, which is great. What I'm not going to do in this talk is try and show you, like, do... I'm not going to try and show you a good time. I'm, I'm not going to try and show... Like, oh, this is me, a pro, doing an expert, beautiful sculpt, because it's actually really hard to talk and sculpt and, and remember everything all at the same time. It's more of a demo of technique. So if this comes out looking like an absolute whale turd, then uh, I apologize, but that's not really the point of what I'm doing today. So <laughs> he said making excuses early doors. Um, so I'm going to move to a crease brush. The crease brush is really great. This is probably my favorite brush. Um, and when you uh, draw with the crease, it's making a valley, like a, you know, a crease. It's just drawing it in. And then if you hit control, it will invert, and this works with all the brushes. Um, so by hitting control, it inverts it from drawing a, a crease or a trough into drawing a peak. So there I've drawn into the, the trough and then I'm gonna hit control and then I'm drawing on the peaks to accentuate that. Something worth bearing in mind is you never get the one, the, the thing that you want in a single stroke. You, you do it with multiple strokes. Well, at least in my experience, that's what I do. So I do multiple strokes and combine multiple brushes to get the effect I want. So I can sort of smooth that peak off a little bit. And then I can go to the pinch tool, which combines beautifully with the, the crease tool. And then I can just run it along here and it will sharpen up those valleys and even sharpen up the peaks if you wanted it to. Um, actually, I'm just going to resharpen that up. Um, another fantastic tool, and this is really powerful, particularly when you're blocking something out, uh, is scrape. There's a flattened brush, which kind of it has a clay-like sort of thing. So as you push down on something, it sort of squishes it out. But the scrape brush just sort of creates these wonderful flat planes. Um, I'm actually going to modify this slightly. View plane. I'll explain that in a moment. But yeah, you can see it sort of, it, it, it'll flatten out our surfaces. If I make it really big, it'll do it really very pronounced. So it's a very powerful brush. Um, just so you're aware, all of these details along the top and all of these details along the side are the same. So everything in this tool panel is like modifiers for the brush, but they're all repeated up here. So don't worry about why is he going up there? Why is he going down there? Sometimes it's just easier. I'm inconsistent. Um, and what I've done with this brush, I've modified it from area plane to view plane. So an area plane, I believe, picks the, the normal so as you can see, the brush is sort of trying to align itself with the normal of the mesh. So if I sculpt there, it's pushing in on the side of the whale. But if I change it to view plane and do it, this should sculpt from my point of view forwards. So you can see what it's done there, which is I, I really like because it's, it's a good way to sort of control things. So for instance, I might want to flatten out this ridge over his eyes. I'll just maneuver myself to being underneath him. And yeah, you can see what's going on there. 
Sam, can you all still hear me? Is everything still okay? Everyone's been very quiet. It's, it's, it's unnerving. Yeah, no, it's great. I think everyone's just um, paying attention. That's a hor- horrifying thought. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> great. So there we go. So that's um, a basic little modifier that you can do with this. Um, so Elastic Deform, another great brush. Elastic Deform is one of the newer brushes which has come in. I don't know if you're aware, but like this whole sculpting engine has been redone in the last couple of versions and it's going through changes. Every version we're getting new tools from a guy called Pablo de Barro. He's like, uh, he's um, one of the blender coders and he's just going crazy with the, the sculpting engine. Um, and one of the things he's done is this elastic deform, and it has a clay, more like a clay sort of feel to it. So when you pull on it, it's got this much bigger fall off. And it's really lovely for doing a bit of organic work um, for changing proportions of things. And, you know, it's great. It's basically the grab brush, but with a, better, with a more organic fall off. So grab brush, as you can see here. Um, and then the elastic deform. Very useful. I'm going to show you snake hook now, and then I'm going to forbid you from ever using it. Okay, snake hook is the most fun that you will ever have in a sculpting <laughs> environment. It is utterly useless. It's not useless, but it it's, look, it's fun. Okay, we can, yay! Now we've got a horny whale, just what we wanted. Um, it's good, but it creates bad topology. Um, and if you're going to do horns and stuff like that, it might be a good idea, particularly in a production sort of pipeline again, to create separate horns, sculpt that one horn, and then duplicate it across the surface, or a couple of them and duplicate it across the surface. I had to do this recently for a dragon, uh, for a short film I'm working on. It's a pain in the ass. It's not as much fun as doing that, yay! But that does create bad topology that doesn't bake down well. So. I forbid you from using it. No, okay, I mean, feel free to ignore me, but there we go. Um, other new additions that I will probably never use, a uh, pose brush, which is great. We can sort of pose this flipper. It works really well with human limbs, but yeah, you can sort of, wee, in case, because obviously you have T-poses and stuff with, with creatures. Uh, you have like, you know, the standard T pose or A pose that they're normally in this default pose. And sometimes that's not great for um, for what you want. When you're sculpting, you might want to move something around and the pose brush is quite useful for that. I can't see myself ever really using it because my pipeline is mired in the ages of tradition. Um, and yeah, and then we'll get on to the big kahuna. This is the bit which everyone's excited about online, and that's the cloth brush. And I guarantee you it's going to go horribly wrong because the cloth brush uses a lot of uh, system resources. So, but it is great. It's really, it's a really useful tool. I'm going to take this, my sculpt level down. Also, this is actually, before we get onto that, um, no, do you know, I'll, I will I'll, I'll carry on on the, sculpt, on the cloth brush for now and I'll get back to that. So uh, the cloth brush basically does cloth simulation in a brush. And it's not always particularly intuitive. It can be a bit tricky to get the settings just right. I'm going to actually, you've got a, a number of different modes for this under deformation. And I find that the one which works best for me normally in most situations is grab. So I'm just going to go in. And I'm going to grab and I'm going to try and create some folds of flesh, some clothy sort of folds here. And I'm trying on the lowest resolution setting. And I wasn't quite doing what I wanted. So I'm going to take it up to two. And as you can see, it's starting to do this weird morphing bit around. And it takes a lot of practice to get used to. And I certainly haven't had enough practice. As I said, this is a very new tool, but it is great fun. And it's going to be more fun when I turn up the, uh, the resolution. Up it goes, and you can start seeing that it's it's doing some interesting stuff. And again, and you can see that it's really doing. And now that's that's going to slow down. There we go. It can be, if you pull too hard, if you use too much strength with it, it, it just, <clears throat> you mash, you know, and um, 
So it does uh, go easy with it, but it can create lovely, lovely effects. Um, obviously, the bigger your brush, the higher your resolution. See that? I've, I've knackered it a bit there. Oop, hit the wrong brush. Hit, hit the wrong button even. There we go. So I could add a little bit of high res cloth around the eyes to make like crow's feet. And yeah, that's it. I really like this tool, but it is finickety and it it doesn't always behave the way you expect it to, which is more down to user error than it is down to a bad tool. This is not a critique of Pablo de Barro's abilities to code. Um, it is mine to use it. Right, there we go. So, um, so we've got a bit of high res detail in there, which is great. But then I might just, you know, I need a bit more high res detail actually in order to demonstrate this properly. Get some intersections there. This might not have been the best way to demonstrate what I was about to demonstrate. Um, anyway, um, using different levels of, of detail means that we can keep that high res detail on level four. And then we can come down here and go, oh, do you know what? Actually, I wanted bigger bags under the eyes. Um, and we could, oop, gonna need a little more resolution than that. Oh, of course, my uh, brush is set to anchored on that one. So I'll just use something else for now. I'll explain that later. So yeah, I'm just gonna paint in some bags under the eyes, change the, Topology, and then if I go to level four, you can see we still retain that high res detail. That you know, that sort of um, all the detail we've done with the cloth brush is still there, but we've we've changed the topology underneath it, which is is great. It's it's really powerful. Um, ooh, what else do I want to do? So uh, at the moment, I've got symmetry turned on also, so you can see that this is doing. I only have to do one side of my mesh, that's really important as a time saver. Um, I'm gonna, oh, do you know what, I'm just gonna, I've got to get onto the other mesh, so I'm gonna just do some stuff real quick. So something which is worth doing uh, quite often, I, I find is just going nuts with the brushes, just to texture it up a bit. You can just sort of texture it out a little. You can try and follow the musculature that you imagine would be there for this creature, just sort of bring it all out. Um, I'm not gonna go any further down the tail than that. We can smooth it off a little bit. We're starting to get some interesting details in. Um, again, with the, um, and this is something I meant to say with the cloth brush, after you've done the cloth brush, it can be really useful to get in with the crease brush find the whirls and stuff in the, in the patterns in the cloth that you like and accentuate them. So I'm just going over it with a crease brush and control key held down to, to create those peaks again. We can just accentuate the bits we like, play down, you know, smooth the bits we didn't like so much. Again, release the control key to paint in the, in the valleys. and really sort of pick that out. So you've got this simulation provided by the cloth brush, but that doesn't mean, I'm gonna need a little more res there. It doesn't mean um, that you can't put the artistic hand back into it after the, uh, after the simulation has been done. So yeah, again, I don't wanna get lost doing this, but yeah, you can sort of, Maybe you'll start getting the creases there and you realize you want them to flow through and maybe join up with the creases on the other side. If you're finding with your strokes that you're not quite getting the, the like profile that you want, so maybe I'm drawing a crease and it's not all that. As I said, you are gonna to have to work into it with a pinch brush afterwards, but you can change the profile here, which is really useful. In fact, actually I can demonstrate that quite well by, you know, we've got this whale's got all these sort of like big warty sort of things on it. So maybe we could do some of those. Um, so I could do that 
and actually that's not too bad there but it's a little bit too rounded at the edges for me I'd like it to be without me having to to work it too much it would be nice if I could just sort of go in and get a sharper finish so what we can do is just create a custom curve to adjust how the brush is interacting with the base and if I draw that next to it oh, strength up to one that's weird doesn't normally give me this much attitude. <laughs> but there you go. You so we're getting a, a, a sharper sort of finish as opposed to this smoother one there, which can be quite nice. You can see it a bit more clearly. Yeah. But yeah, and then we can sort of go around and give them all the mumps we want. Ugh. Obviously, this is going to look really weird with symmetry. Um, again, a little tip after you do when you've done like a lot of high res detail actually let's let's do that now I've, just, I've got time i've got time um so i'm going to use the inflate brush and i'm going to load in textures and this is a really powerful bit when you want to do like once you've got your base done and obviously that ain't done that's one heck of a mess that's one heck of a mess oh golly i don't swear and i i say things like heck Apologies, I'm losing my mind on camera. Um, so once you, imagining that that was a nice looking sculpt and we're happy with it, um, and it's not bad. I mean, considering that I've literally just thrown brushes at it, it's come out okay. That's one of the, that's what I was talking about earlier about um, this mesh is quite forgiving. It's a whale. We don't see ourselves in it so we can muck around and have fun. Um, but imagining that was a good sculpt and we're happy with it. Now we want some high res detail. What we could do is choose the inflate brush, which the inflate brush normally just does, um, does this. Oh, you can't see it because, ooh. yeah, the inflate brush normally, um, oh, that's acting very peculiarly. It seems to be tamping down rather than the other way around. <sighs> Apologies. There we go. So you can see, you can see it's sort of um, as you run it, it'll fatten up the mesh. Really useful brush in its own right, but we're going to use it in a slightly more peculiar fashion. We're going to create a new brush. So, oh. so once you've got, if you if you're on any of these brushes, you want to create a new brush. You just click this little number here where it says next to the brush name, number two. And it creates a, 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 a suffix dot zero zero one on the name of a brush um, because it's made a duplicate of it. We're going to call this brush um, ooh, skin. We're making a skin brush. Um, and what I'm going to do is where it says texture, pan that down. Imagining there's no texture there, I'm going to hit new. And I'm going to call the texture skin. And we need to leave these brush settings and come over to this panel here and just click on that. And that's our texture panel where we can load textures in. And you can see it's loading into the brushes. And we've got the, the texture I just named skin. And it says type image or movie, which is what we want. And we can just open up some images to use in our brushes. Um, now, I have a, a Dropbox account. If you're not familiar with Dropbox, it's an online cloud storage jobby. And my computer's frozen. That's weird. <laughs> um, sorry, this isn't my most powerful machine. My most powerful machine's at home because, obviously, with coronavirus and all that, I'm spending more time working at home. So this is my secondary machine, and it's not quite as kick-ass. But it'll do. It'll do. No whining. Uh, so I have a cloud storage on Dropbox. And um, yeah, inside that I have a Blender folder. And that's where basically I put all my Blender assets. So scripts, add-ons, and brushes. Excuse me, that coffee's gone down the wrong way. And yeah, so as you can see, we've got a bunch of folders here and I'm gonna use Jim Moran, my friend Jim Moran, his uh, brush series that I bought from Blender Market. And we can just get some brush textures. These put all these skin stamps in there. So they're like little 
uh, PNGs, black and white images of skin texture. And it's really good. It's like an encyclopedia of like lip skin and pores and all sorts. And I'm going to choose this lip skin detail because it looks a bit like a rhino-y sort of skin. And that's good. And it's loaded it into our texture panel. We can go back to our brushes. We see that's loaded in, sort of. <laughs> and um, now I could make these further changes down here, but for some reason I'm a difficult man and <laughs> I want to just do it up here because I'm more comfortable up here for this. I'm going to change the texture to view plane. And I'm going to change the stroke from space to anchored. And what that does is when we draw, we pull it out and it will allow us to rotate and spin and place basically. And um, let's move that out. I don't want to press undo because if I undo it, it'll undo the changes to the brush as well. And then I won't know where I am. But this is great because I can take the strength down. And what we can do is we can just start adding in high res detail, probably best to turn off the, uh, um, whatchamacallit, <laughs> the pressure sensitivity. And I'm just gonna sort of pull this around. And normally I would use multiple different images to get more variety, but this is great because we, we can just really sort of work in and get this high, uh, sort of high frequency detail. And, and it looks nice, it looks dead nice. Yeah. So this is also a lot easier on the on the computer's resources than the cloth brush and makes quite a good alternative to it. If you've got like cloth um, fold sort of images, then you can use those to, to sort of detail this out. And what I'd normally do is, you know, I'd go all over the mesh and create this sort of detail um, using a lot of variety. And then to sort of finish it, I would probably go in and use the crease brush to give it sort of cracks in the lips. And what I'm doing here is, is basically uh, a whale lives by its, you know, lives by the eating stuff. It, it eats krill and occasionally uh, imagine the stuff that goes in its mouth fights back and it gets, you know, this cracking over its, uh, over its skin. And you can just start blocking in these scars like little lightning bolts. And then using a pinch brush, and like I did a like a bird of prey and a crow sculpt not so long ago. And then on the talons, where there's a lot of wear, put painting and cracking there, and um, that sort of thing. Really, just a, it's a nice way to bring your creations to life and get uh, a sort of a more, you know, a believable existence from them. And likewise, if you're painting inanimate objects, always pay attention to where the wear and tear will be. If you, you know, anything that has a handle, whether it's a hammer or a gun or whatever, there's gonna be wear and grease patterns on there and stuff and just consider its usage when you're sculpting it. And it's that functionality that sort of comes back in. And I'm going to, again, I'm going to use the control on the crease brush just to pucker this a little bit more. And this is, again, this is sort of uh, very uh, fine detail. So it's like people aren't going to be necessarily up close and examining it. You don't have to be a perfectionist though it can be good fun. I'm certainly not being a perfectionist here and, you know, and it's just how, like, if you look at scar tissue, it puckers and has a certain um, way about it. Oh, I'm using the wrong thing again. Let's go back to the default inflate brush. We can sort of make these little puckering bits. And yeah, anyway, um, Sam, now would be a great time for questions before I move on to the next mesh, if that's all right. Sure thing. Um, John says, could you provide a link to the skin brush sets, please? I cannot. They're paid for. Oh, oh I see. Okay, of course. Um, I can. Um, 
Can you, Sam? Is it possible to treat you like my secretary and ask you? Yeah, to no, it? please do. I will. I'll, I'll, get, I'll get a link to it. It's it's on Blender Market. It's Jim Moran's um, brush sets or something similar. But I will try and find a link for you. Okay. Um, because it's a particularly good pack. There's also so much available on Gumroad. Uh, I've got. Um, I'll be showing you some zips and stitches from uh, a pack which I bought on Gumroad, and it's and it's great. And they're they're actually meant for. Um, ZBrush, but I use them in Blender because most of them are just packs of, of images. So you can kind of use whatever. Any more questions before I uh, ditch this whale? Um, <clears throat> another Sam says, is there any way for us to get a similar rig to work on to the whale? A similar rig? You, I'll be providing a link um, with Sam. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll go, give Sam a link to this model and to the base, uh, the other base mesh I'm about to show you. Perfect. So that you guys can play with it all you like, and uh, yeah, and uh, you know, just because I, I'm saying, oh yeah, this this whale is, you know, it's, it's what I'm currently using as my experimental sort of uh, uh, mesh. Um, but you guys, you know, find what you're comfortable with, what suits your style. I really like that whale because. I just like doing that sort of, as I said, I've, I've already explained why I like the whale. <laughs> I don't want to gush about a whale too much. People will question my uh, <laughs> my intentions towards it. Shall I continue or is there more questions? Uh, that's the only ones we've got in the chat. I've written down loads, but let's get through what you need to get through. And then we Fantastic. Can okay. Time. So uh, as I said, this looks like Huey or whatever from, uh, or, uh, from Malcolm in the Middle. It's not the most attractive thing, but it does have fairly good... Topology. I'm going to hide the eyes for a minute because uh, I repositioned those afterwards. Um, the reason it's a child is I'm working on um, a cartoon series at the moment. I'm trying to get funded, um, and it's about kids in space. So they're all, you know, of childlike proportions. I don't need my reference on here. I'm I'm going to break my cardinal rule, uh, and I'm going to be working without reference for a little while because again this doesn't matter how it looks it's just me demonstrating stuff blender is <laughs> sorry i was i was going to say hungry but I, I i'm going to be badly behaved and say blender is a thirsty bitch uh sorry i just i'm yeah i'm an idiot um it it likes resources it, it wants all your resources and when you're sculpting high res the bigger your mesh is the harder it's going to be on your machine so something i'd recommend is something like this our character, um, it ha he has, or she has a head, and then there's a really clean seam where it meets the clothing. And we can utilize that to our advantage, oops, um, by separating the mesh before we sculpt. So I'm just gonna select uh, an edge loop, that's Alt, right click, and then I'm gonna hit Control plus and grow that selection until I get all of that head. I mean, I'm just going to hit the control and minus key. And now I've got, a, oop, missed a bit. I've just got that head geometry already selected. I can hit P to separate the selection. And now we've got two separate meshes. So I can sculpt this without affecting this. Lovely jubbly. And I think we'll go mat cap, change our mat cap to, to the red clay one. I, I quite like the red clay one. It's very, it's not as pretty as some of the others, but it's really easy to see what you're doing. Um, mirror, uh, mirrors modifiers don't tend to work very well with sculpting. So I'm going to apply that. I'm going to leave the armature one on there. It doesn't really affect anything. I'll turn it off. And again, I'm going to go to multi-res. I'm going to subdivide, subdivide. Just going to keep subdividing. There we go. Lovely. Um, I'll take that down a bit, actually, because we're going to do some underlying stuff first. Uh, what else was there? Oh, I feel like I've forgotten something. Well, that's going to bite me in the ass later, isn't it? So, uh, great. Uh, sculpt mode. Uh, so I can use, you can use a tab key to, to switch between modes. It brings up a pie menu. If you set it up, like I set up earlier, preferences, in, is it key map? Key map preferences, tab for pie menu. You can switch between edit mode, object mode, and sculpt mode using the tab key. Again, I'm just going to drag this panel out so you can see the names of the brushes I'm using. And I'm going to use Elastic Deform because I'm going to use it to change the proportions of our character. So maybe we can go over a little bit more widely spaced. 
sort of thing. I'm not, this is not going to be an attractive <laughs> kid at the end of this. I'm, a, I'm afraid this is uh, just the, uh, the way of me rushing stuff. But as you can see, the elastic deform does a lovely job. You've got to be very careful though, around here, it's, it's pulling away from our geo and that might not be good for us, but it is, uh, yeah, it's a nice way of adjusting proportions. Um, again, I don't know where I'm going with this, so I'm just going to, to just hammer away. So I'm gonna use the inflate brush to, um, just to blow out the, nos the, the, the nose and we're gonna get a much more organic nose. And again, on the wing of the nostril, um, I should be using the radius um, pressure sensitivity so that I can release a bit of a pressure as I get to the top of the, the wing of the nostril. And that's gonna, you know, hopefully look all right. Uh, layer brush, layer brush is, is great. This is, you can see it does, awful things to a mesh, but quite good for poking out nostrils where you need to. Nostril. Um, I hope you guys aren't finding me too irritating. I, I irritate myself when I, I talk on these things and some people finding it endearing, some people feel like I should be locked away. And that's fine. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. Mine is that I should be locked away. So yeah, I'm just using the clay strips here to extend that wing, the, the sort of wing of the nostril there um, down a bit. Give it some flow. And again, using the shift button to uh, smooth out little details. Now, a nose really should have a lot of attention given to it. It's a you know, it's an important feature on our face. And I am rushing this badly and not really considering what nose I want at the end of it. So I don't expect, I do not anticipate a good result. Again, the inflate brush, great for thickening things out a bit. Oh, we're gonna have some Star Trek looking nonsense if I'm not careful. Okay, and then I can use the crease brush just to sort of work into here. Oh yeah. Nope, too hard. Little bit. Lovely, okay. I say lovely, obviously. <laughs> I don't mean that. Hardly lovely, but uh, it's fine. It's fine, stop being critical. As I said, you've got to make things worse before they get better. Um, do, do, do. I'm gonna use the draw brush and just invert it with the control key just to get that sort of soft indentation into the, under the bridge of the nose. And yeah, well, it's a nose, it'll do. And then what we could do is go to the crease brush and we're gonna sort of work on the um, frenulum. I hope it's called the frenulum. I hope I've not like, I occasionally, when you when you like work with creatures a lot, I sort of start learning the names of the anatomy. But what's quite good fun is after a little while you haven't worked on that said creature or, you know, person, um, you start getting the names mixed up. So for all I know, instead of it being the frenulum, uh, I mean, I, <laughs> maybe frenulum is the word for taint. I don't know is what I'm saying. And I can only apologize if I'm getting it wrong. I never would have passed a medical degree. And again, so that was, uh, again, the crease brush and then using the, the inverse of the crease brush with the control key just to pick out these sort of details. And I'm gonna use it a bit, sometimes using, I don't use the crease brush to actually crease stuff so much as just to block out where I want to draw. Um, and now I'm gonna use the inflate brush to fill that area that I blocked out. It's gonna be a little tricky, so. Ah, so when you get this, this is view clipping, you, you know, the, the camera 
is sort of going, you're too close. So I'm going to get to that geometry. I'm going to delete it. I'm going to hide it. So I'm just going to take the clipping down to one mil. But what you might get with this, if, if you've got your clipping on your camera too low and you've got very close together pieces of geometry, you might start getting this flashing zebra ring effect. It's very unattractive. It was very unattractive. I said that like my mother. <laughs> oh, that quality, that, uh, that habit of yours, Christopher, very unattractive. She doesn't sound like that. She's Welsh. Um, but that wouldn't be as funny, would it? Someone's at home going, yeah, it wasn't funny anyway. Shut up. Show us how to sculpt. I'm dwelling too long on this because obviously I'm gabbing rather than doing my job. Right, I'm going to flatten that plane. Oh, actually, I haven't set the wee jobby over here. I haven't set that to view. View plane. Great. So now I know what direction that brush is coming from. I love the scrape brush. So good. The other thing I'd say when sculpting is get in and break that mesh, fuck it right up and have fun with it. And then don't save it <laughs> and just start again. You can always go to file, revert and start again, provided you haven't saved over it. But uh, yeah, just mess it up because the fact is it's like, I was trying to keep, teach my six year old to draw yesterday and she burst into tears because I'm a terrible father and a very bad teacher. But uh, no, she, um, we were trying to, she wanted me to teach her to draw a dog and uh, I was trying to show her and I was going, oh, look, and you can use this shape as a triangle and this shape as a square. And she's like, yeah, but I, I'm six. I can't draw squares or triangles reliably yet, father. So get off my back. And um, yeah, and it was, it was really upsetting for her. But what she didn't realize was you can screw that piece of paper up and start again. It's only a piece of paper. It doesn't matter. Just recycle it because, hey, we only get one world. Um, God, where am I going with this? this is, but the thing is, is, I don't know if you guys are actually still there. I don't know if it's like just disconnected and I'm just talking into the ether like a mad bastard. <laughs> I can confirm we're all still here. I, I'm giggling along. I don't know about I don't know else. if that's worse or better, Sam. Huh. I really don't. <laughs> it's like, oh God, people can hear me. Um, so yeah, my shame is complete. Anyway, uh, what sort of time? Oh my God, I'm running out of time badly. So, um, yeah, I was going to continue to sculpt on this, but I decided to waffle philosophy. Sam, is it okay if I overrun? Uh, yeah, yeah, no problem for me at all. So some stuff I wanted to show you, um, as well as this, important techniques. Uh, so what if we wanted to do some cloves? Well, once you've actually got a base body geometry, I'm going to have to tear through this as quickly as possible. What we can do is, actually, I'm going to have to apply that as well. Uh, we can, I've got a selection already, made on here because there's material selection. So I'm just going to select this, that's the vest and shorts, duplicate. So shift D to duplicate and P, separate, tab back into object mode and select what we just separated. And we've got a duplicate of that geometry. I can tab into edit mode, A to select all, Alt S and very gently pull the stylus and it scales it up along the normals. So it's it's kind of just lifted it up off the skin. You've got to be careful that around the crotch that you don't get too many intersections. So maybe I'll just sculpt uh, smooth that. Apologies for paying attention to the groin. But yeah, it's where you tend to get a lot of intersecting geometry and that will cause problems in the bake. I didn't show you how to bake with the whale. I'm an idiot. Um, we'll get to that. Hopefully we'll get to that. Um, Something else I want to quickly do is I've noticed that there's a belly button on this vest. <laughs> Vests don't have belly buttons, or so I'm reliably informed by my tailor. I don't have a tailor. I'm going to select that geometry M, merge at center. No more belly button. Well, maybe a little belly button. Oh, that's just because we can see through the mesh. There we go. 
So there we go. So we've got this vest and now we might want to sculpt it. We might want to use the cloth brush specifically, um, but uh, we want it to react to the shape which is underneath. So what can we do? Well, we can go to sculpt mode, which I've somehow jumped out of. Nope, not sculpt mode. Back into object mode. <laughs> Let's rename these so we can see what we're doing. Vest. It's not really a vest. Head. It's not really a head. <laughs> okay, it is a head. And body. But with the body geometry selected, I'm going to go to modifier. And I'm going to go to collision. And that gives it a, a, a physics collider that the brush, uh, that the... the um, Cloth brush will recognize, hopefully, fingers crossed. Now it's not foolproof, uh, particularly with smoothing. Smoothing doesn't, uh, uh, all the other brushes don't recognize it as a collision, just for cloth brush. So when you smooth stuff, it might go through and intersect the mesh and that's fine, you can fix it, but it can cause problems if you're not aware of it. Um, so yeah, what we're gonna do, uh, cloth brush, enable collision. And again, I'll change my deformation to grab and I'm just going to start pulling at the geometry and you can see it's it's trying and it won't do it perfectly but it, it will try to um, acknowledge the mesh beneath it. Now I've also got symmetry on, that's a big mistake with cloths because cloth is very very uh, seldom symmetrical and I haven't got a multi-res yet but that's fine because we don't have a lot of time. I don't want to get hung up with details. I've already shown you that you can sculpt back into this with the crease brush um, and whatnot. But yeah, this is doing a surprisingly good job of the collisions, which is nice. Um, Let's go big. Let's see if we can real break this thing. Now, yeah, that, that did so little. <laughs> uh, it needs more res. Um, something which I haven't mentioned is sculpt base mesh. Ticking that is really useful because, uh, so sometimes you want to sculpt it so you can affect the mesh underneath. Um, and that can be super useful just to tick it on and off as you're working. And also um, apply base. If you've got like with our whale, um, you've got a really high res mesh and it's deformed parts of the mesh, you, applying the base before you bake it is really useful. Um, so there we go. I'll just pull them up. the cloth brushes again. It's taking its time, it's doing calculations. Um, I was going to show you how to make a cape really quickly out of this and then using the cloth filter. And um, the cloth filter is much like the um, much like the brush, but it affects the whole shape and can be done for global sort of transformations of cloth. But again, it would re react in, in, in a similar way where it's doing all of this loading. Um, I'll, I will get back to that. I haven't left it. I'm just... Uh, Going to see if I can recover my whale for a second. So if you go to file recover auto save and list it, space whale today 11:45. That looks that looks promising. Blender auto save stuff, and that's a great way to find them. And whilst that's mucking around, I can show you a little bit about applying bases and such. Um, Yes. So, um, oh, actually, I want UVs as well. So, as you can see, the, the viewport subdivision level is zero. If I set it to five, we'll see all of that detail. Um, again, you, so just to, to clarify that, so you've got the local viewport or level viewport which is you know, what's in your everyday viewport, sculpt, which is what you see when you're sculpting, and render, what you see, what the computer sees when it's rendering. So that stuff is important to know. Um, we can, uh, in sculpt mode, I'm going to apply the base. Um, let's have a quick look at the base first. So that's our wireframe. And if I apply the base, Will it work? 
think I might need to be in the correct thing for it, apply base. And what it's doing, it's, it's, it's basically pushing some of the verts around to match the sculpt. Um, not a massively pronounced effect, but then we didn't do anything too crazy with it. Um, and then what we can do is we're going to zero this off and we're going to bake this down onto a normal map. And if you're not familiar with baking, I uh, don't really know how to explain it to you, but we're going to need a shader editor. We're going to need, um, I'll start this from fresh actually. So we can create a new image up here. We can set the resolution 4096 by 4096 because I want it to be fairly high res. And we'll call this uh, normal whale bake. And I'm just going to click OK. And I'm just going to zoom out. You've got a black document. Great. Uh, now in this image texture, I'm going to choose that image. What was it called? Normal whale bake. And I've chosen that image, but I've kept that image disconnected for now, just to, so it doesn't cause us any problems. I'm on a uh, viewport. So if I'm going to use the, the mesh at zero subdivisions, so no multi-res, then that's what I want to bake to that level. So I think it should be all right, zero on there. And then if we go into our rendering options, we've got a bake option, provided you're in cycles. It won't work in EV but it's not particularly intensive, hopefully, so it should be all right. And we've got, uh, un we can unfill this bake option. We've got this big bake button and make sure that tick, you tick bake from multi-res. And now it's going to bake the, red, the, the sculpting from level five down to level zero. And if I click that, hopefully the computer won't explode. You can see down here, multi-res bake goes to 100%. And then up here, hey, we have an image. Now, all I need to do is to connect that to my shader so these are, if you're not familiar with Blender's shader system, it's a node-based system. Um, this is your principal BSDF, which is the standard sort of shader, which gives you many, 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 many options. Um, and you don't need to worry. All you need to know, don't need to worry about that. Don't need to worry about anything. We can create a normal map. So let's delete stuff and do it again. So shift A to go to your add menu, click search image, image texture. That's how you bring up that. And then you load up your, I'll just delete, um, bring up your image that you've named. Then shift A, search normal map. And we'll plug the color from the image into the normal map, which is going to translate this image into a normal map. We're going to choose the UV map that we've got here, which should be the only UV map represented on your model. So it should just be a choice of one, which makes it nice and easy. We'll leave the strength as it is, and we'll plug the normal into the normal of our principal shader. That's all you need at the most base level, except one tiny tweak. Change this to single image and the color space, and this is really important to non-color. I'm not gonna do that for a second because I wanna show you what that actually means. Do, 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 do. I'm going to turn on rendered mode. And actually, I will do, I will do that now because I want it to work. <laughs> oh, this is going to be really annoying if there's a glitch and a reason why, for some reason, it won't do it. Actually, we can change it over to Eevee so it's easier to see. Um, <laughs> Oh, our bake has disappeared. Well, that would explain why that's not working. I missed a vital snap. Normally it doesn't delete, uh, doesn't uh, disappear quite that quickly. Bear with me one second. We'll do this again. I'll just disconnect this node, select it, bake that fella again. Baking should happen to image with image buffer. Well, shut up. Computer's fighting me. Uh, we'll just leave this as untitled. There we go. Untitled. And we'll bake it again. That was annoying, wasn't it? 
So yeah, we can see all those details have been baked down into this map. What we're going to do now is you'll notice by the image, it's got a little asterisk next to it. And that means that there are unsaved images. I'm going to save as Bakey the Whale. Bakey the Whale. OK, and for some reason, it hasn't changed its name. That's peculiar, but uh, whatever. It seems to have saved it, so hopefully it'll stick around. If not, I'll go and find Bakey the Whale. I've plugged that in, and I'll change that to non-color. What, what will happen, if you don't do non-color, you get this disjointed bit between seams where like the normals look like they're flipped. So it like you'll have a big dark area and it's really weirdly shiny and you'll still have detail, but it won't make any sense. And that's because of the, it really needs to be set to non-color when you're doing this. And there we go. So now we've actually got a very low res little fella, but he's got some super high res qualities. You can, of course, turn this up a tiny bit if you wanted to, or we could just get rid of this, pretend I've deleted it, and add a subdiv surface to smooth out some of the lumps and bumps and combine that with the normal map. You can, I don't know if you can all see this clearly, maybe I'll change the shader a little bit so that you can see what's going on. Uh, turn down the specular so it's not so shiny, turn up the roughness a little bit. Oh, we can give them subsurface because we're an Eevee. <laughs> Great, turn on subsurface. And yeah, and I, I, obviously when you're presenting a model, stick some lights around it. Big area lights are nice. And I, I give like one a blue tone, one a yellow or a pink tone, just to give that contrast in your model, which can be fun. Um, never use too much subsurf because you'll lose all your details in the subsurf, or I'll just turn it off for now because hey, performance is everything. And as you can see, that's, that's a really nice way to get stuff together. Combine that with a painted texture map, which you can also do in Blender. You don't need substance painter and so on. And you've got yourself a winning combination. It's a whole pipeline in one. It's not always as powerful as some other tools, such as uh, substance painter. Um, and yeah, but it is fun. And it is, it's good enough. It's just a bit slow. There we go. So my cloth brush has done its clothy things. Um, Ooh, gross. Uh, so I knackered it. There we go. Uh, so assuming that was what you wanted to do with a cloth brush, we've already got some cloth going on. I want to show you one more trick. Actually, I'll show you two more tricks. Is that all right, Sam? Two more tricks very quickly? Yeah, please do. Sam's got left and gone home. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Don't blame me. So like with, particularly with cloth um, and clothing, a boundary brush is quite good fun because you can uh, ugh, make turnips. Uh, obviously, you want to spend some time doing that. But uh, if you go to your tools, you've got bend and maybe change this to constant, we might get a really interesting little thing. So yeah, you could sort of turn it and then shrink it again. A little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. There we go. And yeah instant turn ups using the boundary brush. Obviously there's a slight problem with that in the sense that um, now we've got the normals, if you're not aware of what normals are, um, they're basically a little bit, bit of information that comes with every polygon in your, um, in your model and it basically, and, and even every vert um, and it, and it basically says which way it's facing. And some software like Blender deals with normals in a quite a cavalier fashion. And then some game engines are very strict about them. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, boundary brush, that's good fun. And this is the important one. So again, much like the skin brush, um, if you want to add some fine details, I'm gonna take this all the way up to five because I'm showing off. I could actually see the uh, the feed stuttering there as my computer cries. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create another brush again with the inflate brush. And we'll go over here, click, and we'll call it zipper. And we're going to go to texture, new texture, zip. And load up uh, brushes. 
and I've got this Ultimate Cloth Alpha Pack, which I got off Gumroad. Stitches. And I'm going to choose a zipper image. Okay, so what happens when we paint with this? As you can see, we're getting a bit of a note. It, it actually worked straight off the bat, which is really annoying because normally it doesn't. And then I have to show you how to get there. Uh, but it worked off right off the bat. It's not too bad. Oh, it's because it's tiling. There we go. So you can use it tiled, <coughs> which is great if it lines up. Um, if it doesn't line up, there's ways around that, but it's not what I wanted to show you. So I'm gonna change this to view plane. I'm gonna change uh, the fall off. It's very important. The fall off is set to smooth. And uh, I'll just show you what, what we've got. As you can see, all the stamping of the image is overlapping itself, but with a, a smooth fall off and spacing set to 50%, you start to get the right sort of effect. And we can change our um, angle here to rake, and you can get away with slight changes of direction with it, which is quite nice, um, particularly if the radius is, is smaller rather than larger. We want a constant strength. <clears throat> oh, and something which I haven't even touched on is stroke stabilization. So if I do that, you can see this um, line and all it's doing is it's smoothing out the stroke for me. Um, I'll turn it off for now because it could be a little bit unwieldy, particularly at those sort of sizes. Let's just do it again. Hold Alt and middle mouse and I can switch between all the graphic cameras, which is great for this sort of painting. I'm just gonna brush. Come on, kick in. Wow, that's a big brush. Oh, it's the radius is changing. Again, you want all your pressure options turned off for this. And I'll just turn that off. It's not doing what I want it to. But yeah, we can paint in zippers. And I think my rake is, oh, rake is working. That's unusual. Normally it behaves itself for me, but today apparently not. Yeah, it doesn't like that at all. Anyway, so that was, I mean, it's, it's not perfect, but you can play around with those settings. Obviously you don't have the time to do it now because I've overrun horribly. Um, but yeah, that's how you can sort of affect these sort of, you know, um, high frequency details without sort of sculpting every zip yourself. You want to make sure you've got enough resolution and, and all that jazz. So I think that's probably the best, best for me to stop there before I get too carried away. Um, there was plenty more I would have loved to show you. Um, but then that's, that's Blender View. There's so many bits to this software, which are great, but there's also, it means there's a lot to learn and it's always an adventure and an exploration. And I encourage you to sort of embark on that journey because it's, it's really rewarding, sometimes frustrating, but there's, there's lots to it, uh, to be explored. So, uh, yeah. How was that, Sam? That was awesome. Thanks, Chris. That was really interesting. Cool. Good stuff. Many thanks. Um, have you got time for a few questions? I've got all the time in the world. Well, I don't have all the time in the world at all, but I've got plenty of time for you guys. Um, so one thing I noted down was um, you said, I've got the brush set to anchored, and I'll explain what that is later. Yeah. So um, when I was showing you the on the whale, uh, can we go back to the whale? So uh, when I set the texture on here, so where's my inflate brush gone? Um, I set up that whole skin brush and I think we've lost our texture there. That's weird. No, nope, it is it is there, that's great. So it's set to space on the stroke method. If I change that to anchored, when I pull the brush, oh, for goodness sake, why is it not working? It's been right annoying because <laughs> I haven't got the multi-res on. So if I pull the brush, you can see it scales up that, Im that image stamp. <clears throat> it's anchored to a single point and you just control the, the thing. So it's that as opposed to drawing like this. Do you see? Oh, uh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, so that's, that's all, all that was. Anything else? 
Um, nothing coming in on the chat. Maybe people have other lessons to get to. Um, I've got a question. What's your favorite project you've worked on or favorite thing that you've sculpted? Um, I was doing a crow a few years ago. They said they were going to do a remake of the crow movie, which was one of my favorite movies because I'm a 90s kid. Uh, they were going to do a remake based in Pinewood, Cardiff. And I thought, right, I'm never going to get that gig, but maybe I can get some YouTube hits by doing, um, uh, showing how to make a crow in Blender. And I got it about 90% of the way, and then they decided they weren't going to do the movie anyway. But <laughs> I was sculpting the crow's, the, the literal talons of the crow, and for some reason I just became obsessed with it, and I just kept going in and, and nuancing it. And rather than using high-frequency brushes, I sculpted every little fold of that fellow's feet and I really enjoyed it I don't know why that was compelling for me but a lot of those techniques I've, I'm doing a short film about dragons and um, I, I took those techniques over to sculpting those dragons albeit a little more quickly because I just don't have time to work on that film but that's that's been really good fun making little hatchling dragons and stuff like that so yeah probably uh, crow's crow's feet nice. actually that crow got used in an advert for Samsung uh, or, or the wings mechanics that I built for the crow, I had to transfer those onto an eagle that flies around with a Samsung hard drive on. Um, but we did the whole advert, did all the visual effects, and then Samsung went, that's a terrible way to advertise hard drives. Fortunately, it wasn't my concept. I was just visual effects. But yeah, there you go. <laughs> nice. Um, have you done sculpting in real life as well? Like, If you've moulded clay with your hands, does it make you better in Blender? I haven't since art college, uh, and I wasn't very good at it, uh, as I recall. Um, the closest thing I've done is stop motion with plasticine with my daughter, and that's been very rewarding. I feel like I probably could sculpt now. Uh, to some extent, I've got a much firmer grasp of what it is, and I certainly recommend trying it if you've got the time. I mean, I'm juggling projects. It's just keeping things afloat. I'm moving from one discipline to another constantly, so that can be quite challenging um but yeah i'd love to actually do some sculpt. I was, I was watching taskmaster last night and there was uh, the episode where joe brand brings in a sculpture her dad did of her as one of the prizes and it's sort of like they're all like oh shit it's rubbish and i was like that's not bad i'd, I'd give that a crack i mean uh, and joe brand would be actually great to sculpt wouldn't he? she's got a really interesting face and wrinkles and depth and all that sort of stuff it's really hard to sculpt like children and and stuff like that because there's less defining features, but they have so much character. So you've got to achieve more with less. Whereas old fuckers like us, you know, it's like, ah, wrinkles, <laughs> uh, bonk eye, bad teeth. Oh, I'm talking about me, not you. You're very <laughs> um, So yeah, it, it's one of those things where you know, yeah, I'd very much enjoy that, I think. Um, we've got a question from John who says, can you explain a little more about how the multires modifier works? The multi-res modifier. Multi-res. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I can't read. So essentially, it's creating instances of a mesh. So you start with your base mesh, um, as we can see here. And it creates subdivided layers of versions of that. And each version you sculpt on that layer, it affects the layer above. So it's a bit like layering blankets. Yeah. So it's like, imagine like you're, you're laying, uh, you've got your, your floor and you put a blanket on it and under that blanket, you put some beans and that displaces that blanket. And the next blanket is displaced by that. But then on top of that blanket, you put some more beans and they displace it. I don't know why I'm using beans. It's a very bad analogy, but it's, it's these layers all affect each other all the way up. But the layers, each layer up is a finer, denser mesh. So like, Level five, if I were to apply this, oh, actually I'll probably crash the computer. <laughs> it's, it's not powerful enough. Um, let's just do that. If I apply this, oh, actually before I apply it, I'll show you that's the, the mesh. If I apply all five levels or, or four levels of this and then look at the mesh, that's what it looks like, super dense. So that's all it's doing is it's allowing you these, these sort of temporary meshes to sculpt on. 
to create all this detail that you then bake down into a normal map, which is an image, and that is applied at the texturing level to give the illusion of a high res, uh, high density mesh. And that means that your whale, with all of its displacement and bump, can be used in a game engine without the game engine exploding. Um, whereas if you were to try and take this level of detail of mesh density into a game engine, it probably wouldn't work, even with the advances in Unreal Engine that have come along, where you see those caves and all that, and it's gorgeous. Well, that wouldn't work because you'd need deferred rendering to, oh, too, too complicated, sorry. Um, it wouldn't work necessarily with a character. You still need, you can have higher density meshes nowadays than you could a few years ago. But I mean, you never know what the project's gonna be. So like, I'm working on a mobile game at the moment and it's like working on a game in the eighties. It's so, it's so restrictive with shaders and the, the density of a mesh. So yeah, you're always looking particularly with game stuff. And I don't do a lot of game stuff. I'm far from an expert in that. I'm more film and animation um, sort of stuff. Yeah, you're always looking for a, a you know efficiency in a mesh, less verts, more uh, and more detail per vert for it. Which yeah, I hope that answers a question. It was a bit waffly. I apologise. That's a part two to John's question in the chat. Of course. Of course. Um, so he says, but you need enough detail on the base mesh to subdivide using the multi res. Otherwise, when it subdivides, you lose detail. Question mark. For example, if you sorry, apply... can you say it again? Just a little <laughs> quiet. Okay, um, so you need enough detail on the base mesh to subdivide using the multi-res. Otherwise, when it subdivides, you lose detail. It's not that you lose detail; it's that there's nothing there. I mean, like, uh, it's also like you know when I was talking about the snake hook. The problem you might find with the snake hook brush. Um, oh God, I need this to be and multi resed again. So there we go, that worked out. <laughs> if I snake hook this and pull out a horn, that's okay at like a high, um, high density level, yeah? But if, uh, if we look at, um, even if I apply that to the base, if I apply that down and then we come out of there, you can see there's not enough geometry to hold that detail that you've added. So you want your proportions and you want your base mesh to be a base, to be like, if there's horns, if there's limbs, you, you, if you were to work from a cube and try and do this, and then you try to bake all of this down onto the cube, you just wind up with a cube with like whale wrinkles all over it. It wouldn't. It wouldn't. Wouldn't stand. So you you have to have good topology. And, and one of the other things you'll find is like here these these um, these polygons are rectangular rather than square, and that means that you'll actually get stretching as you start to paint your detail in. You'll start getting stretching if you paint in a certain direction. You, you what you really want is very even quads. But I threw this to, together for a, a concept, a piece of concept work, and it wasn't important that I had great topology. Um, it's it's good, it's okay topology. It's good enough. But yeah, if you don't have the you know the right supporting topology, then you're in for trouble. There's actually a excuse me a second. There's this little book called uh, the topology workbook and hang on, let's change the exposure on my camera there we go um and yeah it's this little book it's a couple of quid and it's got lots of um information on topology in there for artists and i mean i wish i'd got this when i started because i got it now and i'm like yeah i already know all this but bloody hell that's succinct and it's really it's, it's good might be a little more, you don't have to memorize everything in that book. It's just, it's a good guide to topology. And topology is absolutely vital in all aspects of uh, 3D modeling. If you, it's one of those things though, you don't need to understand it today. You just need to start understanding it today and work on it. Because no one's got a really encyclopedic knowledge of topology. I don't know anyone who is that, you know, savvy with topology. It's a very difficult thing and it's just a, a knowledge that will evolve don't stress yourself out about it just do your best um 
and always be you know be curious about it and to try a little more with topology but yeah you do need to have some detail in your base mesh uh lest you've got nothing to bake down to or nothing to deform but yeah i would i would create for a game engine i would create your basic character i would rig him i'd have it all set up before i start looking at doing the, you know the final sculpt and add in you know like with the the clothing i created a separate piece of geometry for that clothing i didn't sculpt the clothing onto the flesh necessarily and what you can do actually is once you're actually into the game engine you can delete or mask the underlying skin if you're not going to if you're not going to use it you can get rid of that but it's having those options and having the separate pieces of mesh to do it is is useful i'm i'm waffling again i'm just off on them uh john says we're on the same page so i think you've explained it perfectly thank you uh apologies for the waffles is there anything else i can uh, help with um there is nothing else in the chat so i think we might be good actually excellent thank, thank you thank you for your time that was well, really good I it's been it. a pleasure um circling the drain of madness whilst on camera <laughs> it's um, been great i'll send you a link to those meshes and if you, there's any other links that you wanted uh it was the jim moran's brush set wasn't it i'll send you that and then uh yeah Brilliant. Oh, Gateway College says they've loved it. So it's Fantastic. good. Oh, and Loughborough said they loved it as well, but they had to go about 12 ish. But yeah, thank you. It's obviously okay. gone down well. Um, yeah, success. <laughs> really appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. It's been an absolute pleasure. Anytime. All right. Speak to you soon. Cheers. Bye bye. Right, hang out. <laughs> <laughs> there should be a red uh, button somewhere in the bottom. Yeah, right. there should be a big red button. <laughs> oh, there's stop sharing and bye bye. Bye bye.